It's time for a new topic on Two Women Talking. I am Leanna Kay, a Kersner, whatever, tomboy, son, <laughs> W. Erickson, girly girl, author of Calidus Chronicles Volume 1, by the Parts and Noble or Amazon today. Links in the description box. And uh, Song wanted to elaborate on a <laughs> video I did personally about toxic fandom. And we talked about, yeah, I mean, it was a half hour. We could talk for four hours on it. Let's aim for two. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot more to talk about. And I want, whenever I do a dialogue song, I, I always start with definitions. Oh yeah. It's, it's really important. And the word toxic is one that understandably gets people a little jumpy. And so for me, the term toxic, like it, I, I use words very literally. So it means it, the fandom starts poisoning itself and the and the dialogue surrounding the show what does it mean to you i i agree with that definition i also think it's taking it to a point where you become so invested in the property that you refuse to hear anything bad about it and yeah, okay. if anyone does dare to criticize it, then you consider them to be a bad person and cue death threats. Uh, that's that's interesting because a lot of the times I see the media or the normies uh, use toxic fandom. It tends to be about, you know, the minority of Star Wars fans who are, say, you know, making racist comments about Reva in, yeah. in, Ob in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, but... Uh, yeah. So I and I want to make clear on that point right off the top, because this is another really sensitive point for people that just not liking something a fandom like a, a property has done mm -hmm. uh, doesn't make you toxic. It's no reasons and how it's like you said, the intensity when mm -hmm. there is an investment that people are going, whoa, OK, this does not this this does this is not commensurate with a conversation about a fictional property so yeah i, I want because i understand why people are are jumpy about jumpy is not the right word but it it is fair that there needs to be room for people to go something about this is hitting me wrong yeah, and not be branded a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, so on and so forth. So all that's right off the bat. Now I'll go over the the things I said in the video just for people who didn't watch it so they can catch up. So yeah. one, I said, you know, the IP is good but overrated. The there's a fake moral high ground among the mm. position of the fandom. Um, there's a lot of shipping in the fandom. Uh, this the uh, next one was a combo one. There are clashing generations in the fandom, you know, fandoms that have been a really, around a really long time, like Star Wars, Star Trek, He-Man, stuff like that. <laughs> I combine that with the IP overstays its welcome. Um, fans have to wait a long time between installments, like Game of Thrones. Oh. Okay, I, I have a deliberate term or a specific term for that. I call it hiatus brain. Yes, you you've said that before mm -hmm. yeah hiatus brain but i said all of these things can exist but a fandom tends to stay a moderate level of toxic unless the creators fan the flames it mm -hmm. really does seem like when the creators get involved and start fighting actively but when they center the toxic fans and you know act like they're the ones that matter and they have to be stopped that's when things get really, really nuts. I can't think of a single example where, you know, a creator didn't get involved and things went went completely bananagrams. And I think something we've seen with the advent of social media. Oh, I used the word advent. Advent. I, <laughs> the word for um, today is advent. <laughs> I I just like when I use intelligent words. Um, one of the things about the advent and the rise of social media is we've started to have more access right. to show creators. And one that can either lead to a situation of, oh no, the creator said something terrible. 
uh they're evil you shouldn't like this yeah. property yada yada but we're not talking about that yeah it's the parasocial relationship yeah. that fans will start to develop where it's it's an almost worshipful and just oh they're the creator they're so cool they created this thing i like and i get it because it's like there are creators that you know i really admire not not so much writers or artists really but it's like like ip creators yeah not so much that i mean i i I still geek out that i'm friends with you so it's like i get (laughs) the relationship where people become extremely they're not just a fan of the ip they're a fan of the person and so if you dare to criticize the person then oh that makes you bad too right and I, I, i've seen that i've seen like, the opposite as well that yeah. somebody comes in i mean look at what happened with kevin smith and dave filoni i mean okay well there, there are things to criticize about their behavior but it became very personal between them and the fandoms but I mean, it's not even just about behavior because we already said we're going to get to Steven Universe today. Right. So yeah. I, I'm just going to rip that Band-Aid off. So like Rebecca Sugar, who created Steven Universe, she, so she was the first female showrunner at Cartoon Network. So there's been a theory that part okay. of why they kept Steven Universe around as long as they did was just because they didn't want to cancel a show that had that was their first female run show even though now what were the ratings like on steven universe and here's the thing no one really knows and part of that is because it didn't have a normal serialization serialization schedule they Mm -hmm. did these steven bombs every few months where it was just like six episodes came out all at the same time in rapid succession so this wasn't a normal schedule so, like, no one's really sure what the ratings actually look like. And this, this was on Cartoon Network? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I will say that it's very, very unlikely they kept a show around because of identity politics. They just don't do that. What it could have been. And, okay, this is identity demographics, but it is not mm-hmm. the same as identity politics. It's strictly cynical dollars and cents. Yep. Sometimes they keep a show around that doesn't do great, because it does better than average with a particular demo that they're trying to cultivate. So and that's I, probably more it. That makes sense. Yeah. So, but one thing I noticed was you couldn't criticize Rebecca Sugar. Like, right. not even just her personally, but if you tried to say, hey, maybe once she realized how Cartoon Network was jerking the schedule around, maybe she should have started to actually craft her story around that. Maybe instead of setting up this huge world ending thing and then going on hiatus, she shouldn't have come back from hiatus and then had four or five episodes that were just screwing around in the human world, completely Uh ignoring that the world issue. ending issue yeah that, that that got somebody labeled a problem yeah but so if you say hey the writing just isn't great and the not the not the timing the the story beats are all out of whack if you say that okay. like, oh no how dare you criticize her no it, it's all cartoon network's fault okay but she could have learned to work around the scheduling on that well it it's also I I I have obvious personal reasons for why I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. Are the story beats goofy or aren't they? If so, that's a fair point. And I don't think she could figure out if she wanted a fun beach city story with just the quirky characters or she wanted the epic story. So she was trying to tell both. And part of it was, even if identity politics or whatever wasn't involved in the behind the scenes stuff, mm-hmm. it very much was for the fandom. Oh, because yeah. You, okay. You no doubt there. Yeah. Yeah. So you have uh, all these 
gay coded characters mm-hmm. which is it's barely even coding at this point it's yeah <sighs> they were they were uh, maybe because it was the cal art style and i have this wrong they were supposed to be children weren't they the the gems are well the humans you know steve and connie are definitely supposed to right. be children right. although i remember watching the first season and asking a friend so wait how old is steven supposed to be and she was like i yeah. think he's eight and then it came out no he's he's 13 okay but he's, he's 13 <laughs> yeah okay okay and, you know it, steven in a way actually reminds me of a guy i used to know yeah so, me too who was kind of especially when you see him like later and even some of the fan art where he grows up and he's got the dark curly hair yeah. and all that and I'm like oh he, he really reminds me of this guy I used to know um so it's like that never really bothered me there was a bit of oh this is so you know this is non-toxic masculinity and I'm like okay but th- he's 13 it, it, it's also Stephen very much kind of it, it doesn't feel like non-toxic masculinity. It does feel like feminization at some points. Okay. So that always. I have it, a it really fe- hard time determining this stuff when the character is that young. True. And yeah. like, I, I think they were trying to make a point like, oh, this is what a, a, a healthy boy is. And I'm like, I, I, I just, I just, I just, mm, okay. And, I don't and, know. Uh, that that I think is where I, I see where you're going with this now. And I agree that that probably fueled some of it because there's no one, there are things we know are unhealthy mm-hmm. or, or displays of unhealthy behavior. There is no one way to be a healthy boy, girl, or anything else. Mm-hmm. And that I think when, when people start narrowing morality that way in art and again this this is something i can tell you right now this is something that drives creatives crazy behind the scenes and people don't talk about it because every every time somebody opens their mouth on this topic somebody howls we made you you know you're not listening to the fans we we should like it like there is no nothing gained and people argue with me all the time on this but there is nothing gained and by people. I mean, people who have not put something out and had the public judge it, but yeah. the, it is known. There's nothing gained by trying to have the philosophical debate about the story and theme versus politics. I have had this conversation numerous times behind closed doors, PR goes nuts on you if you say it in public so in this case it's not the creators it's not necessarily the network it's the pr department who likes leveraging and we we can talk about why if you're interested over can move on but they like leveraging those politics because it's easy in the short term Mm -hmm. and i think that that is something that's frustrating because it's like i i i understand pr but i also want to i, I believe a story should be able to stand on its own oh, me too. and it, it 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 shouldn't need something like oh it's all this gay coding oh it's feminist and here's the thing it when you actually dig into it some of the stuff Rebecca put sugar put in that story is really questionable. You mean and as it goes on and there's more the, like some of the relationship stuff? It's, it, it's some of it's the relationship stuff. Some of it is, you know, for someone who is considered so progressive, why did they create a giant fusion who is extremely animalistic and violent and voiced by Nicki Minaj? I would still love to know how the fuck that happened. <laughs> what? The, the how they got the- how they got Nicki Minaj to come in and voice a character. She was probably a fan of the show. It was in or, season or one. She was like, or she was well, that was probably something where because 
I mean, she had a really rough road when she first started. There was a lot of strange, that a lot, I mean, Nicki Minaj has done some stuff that, okay, she deserves criticism for, <laughs> um, like justifying her partner's um, rape or, or sexual assault or something like that. Yeah. Like, okay, not good. But back then people didn't, that hadn't happened yet. Yeah. And, and I, I yeah. don't remember the exact timing. So it's. Yeah, I just, if it was around that time, I remember she was taking a lot of flack for her artistry mm-hmm. and the sort of imagery she chose to use. And it could have just been, she was offered it. It's usually the network. Was that Cartoon Network? I forget. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so Cartoon Network is owned by, I don't remember who, but so-and-so. They have some deal with a record company that's like, hey, we have this artist. Can you put them in? It's this whole build. And so that was probably part of it. That might explain yeah. it. So, so there was that design, which people criticized as being fairly racist, especially when more white-coated characters would and, fuse and it would be more elegant and graceful and let's be let's be real there is a problem among white progressive circles with racism mm-hmm. and that yeah. that particular thing very much needs to be i don't like saying called out but we do have to be constantly aware that it's very easy to go wrong there yeah and, and that's a, that's a problem too because i mean look at kang right yeah, yeah. marvel decided to make the big bad of phase four five well more more five even though he premiered in four unofficially god that's confusing <sighs> but you know okay he's he's black and he's the villain and he's angry and obsessed with control is that a nuanced depiction of a character and the best guy for the part got it because he is very nuanced in the way he handles that anger or is it the angry black man stereotype people are going to have different views on that Mm -hmm. and you know a movie like the woman king got blacklisted in hollywood apparently while that script was going around people were being told this is a career killer don't take it and hollywood wants something like that that gets in the bloodstream they tend to want to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy and i Mm -hmm. i saw that movie i thought it was a really interesting it was a really it it The Dahomey of the Woman King is about as historic as New York in Spider-Man and Daredevil, right? Like, it's not our New York. It's like, and we can do that with white cities. But the minute it becomes a story that centers especially Black women, it becomes this thing. And so because someone pointed out to me that, you know, there was all this there's all this pushback whenever they cast a black woman in something internationally and by internationally, specifically here, Asia. And I'm not saying this is my opinion. I'm saying that I have been privy to behind the scenes conversations about casting precisely because they don't want to completely shut off Asia by casting a black woman. And I mean, that's why Finn got cut in Star Wars. Yep. Yeah. And but and so I guess it all depends on how they're depicted, right? Because someone pointed out Fast and the Furious did does really well in Asia. Well, here's the thing. I remember I remember seeing a quote from a Chinese review where they said if they had to have an African-American, why couldn't it have been an attractive one like Will Smith? Oh, you're right. You're right. It's colorism. <laughs> yeah. And so that was specifically referring to John Boyega. And you're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. That that squares it for me because a lot of the Fast and the Furious guys are, are mixed race. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it it this is a real thing. I remember when the show Scandal came out you know the uh i think that was a shonda rhyme show but it I was believe so, uh, yeah. carrie washington 
mm-hmm. who was playing a character very loosely based on a real life uh, lawyer that worked in the George Bush Senior administration. I believe huh. it wasn't W because you know obviously different, but she she was black, and she had to tell George Bush in advance that yeah, th- there's an affair like that's <laughs> which never happened, right? And it was apparently not only was it really difficult apparently to find an actor whose agent would send him to the audition, but they were they had to be prepared to just not this is not going to do well in china mm-hmm. it's just not and you know so it is a it is a statement when a movie company does this no one is insisting it's and th- this is the whole thing about the toxicity of the whole woke thing mm-hmm. and again I am not saying everyone who has used the word woke ever is toxic. I am not saying that the simple use of the word is racist. I have used it ironically. I have used it so that I can be understood in conversations with people who don't think like me. Yeah. But when they insist that Hollywood rewards these things, that is a gross oversimplification. And what's going on, and pe- people tune out when I start talking about this, and I don't understand why, because this is basic dollars and cents. This is why it's happening. We know that the Black population, especially the Black little middle class, the Black middle class in America is one of the, mo- the fastest growing purchasing demographics, not in, mere, in sheer numbers, purchasing demographics black people are starting to accumulate wealth Mm -hmm. in the u.s and that makes them very very appealing to advertisers part of the reason she hulk was so lifted on the shoulders is it did extremely well with black women that's a desirable demographic right now back in the 90s when i started working in tv it was 18 to 24 male that's Mm -hmm. the that's the demographic everybody wanted why because they're persuadable. One, they watch these shows. Two, they pay for these shows. Three, you can convince them to switch brands. Mm -hmm. That's the whole calculus. Now we've got Latinos who, or Latin people, sorry, I was gendered there. Um, You've got Latin people and Mexicans. Mexicans are Chicano, not, not Latin, but they are a massively growing demographic in the U.S., And some Hispanic, Spanish-speaking people have been in the U.S. for generations. They are not immigrants. They speak English. They have money. They're college-educated. And that population is growing exponentially. And, And then you've got the issue of, well, trademarks are expensive and companies don't want to take any more of them. And that's why I found the pivot in the Mandalorian so curious Mm -hmm. because it's going backwards in terms of you had a Latin Latino lead. I can say Latino because Pedro Pascal is male. Mm -hmm. Um, You have a Latino lead and you sideline him for a white woman. Mm -hmm. And anyone who points that out, gets ignored or jumped on. Now, to me, that's exactly what you're talking about. And I I don't know when, I don't know exactly when Star Wars fandom became so toxic. It's like, it's like it's been growing. It it definitely, I mean, the the 90s when the new movies came out, I'll admit some of the longtime fans were not kind to people who liked the new movies they uh i mean look what ahmed best had to go through yeah yeah i mean what what happened with him and the whole jar jar binks thing was was bad like that's not even i can't even call that toxic that was just straight out bullying that was not fair to him i have no idea why people take bad creative decisions out on the actor 
the actor has so little power in that equation. And, and like, here's the thing I noticed, especially when I was on Tumblr, I would see some people just cannot differentiate an actor from a character. I remember when Peter Capaldi was cast as the doctor. Oh, and that was, that was awful. So not even just that, but I remember someone posting on Tumblr, a gift set of him from what is it? That show Veeps or okay. something. He and was it was Veeps? just, he's been in so much, not yeah. Veeps. He was on something. Okay. But it, they posted gifts of like all these scenes where like he's cursing and they're like, this is who they cast to play the doctor in a family friendly show. And someone commented and was like, you know, he doesn't have to curse. Right. It, it he's quoting a script. See, he's that, reading a script. That was one I saw. I saw an unhealthy thing for me. It's like you said, they get too attached. Mm hmm. Uh, I saw an unhealthy thing forming during the Tenant run. Mm -hmm. And again, not blaming David Tennant for this. He's a great no. actor. He, during the Tenant run, some of the things in Doctor Who during that run were disturbing. And you, you weren't allowed to criticize. And then the Matt Smith run continued the disturbing elements in and I wish people would start saying disturbing instead of problematic or something else that it it some of the things they were doing disturbed me the treatment mm -hmm. of uh river river song mm -hmm. by and and I two characters named river came down at the same time I always mix them up once from firefly once from, yeah. I know but you know the that was an abusive relationship oh yeah and you weren't allowed to talk about that. And part of the reason you couldn't talk about it is that so many, so many women fans of Doctor Who just so latched on to that tenant doctor. And I could well, because suddenly the doctor was sexy. I could the the doctor reads as so asexual to me. I don't get this. And it, it could be that's what it is, that they just have this thing about unavailable men. But I remember somebody flipping out on me. And this is somebody who otherwise is is very, you know, so-called progressive. They self-identify as a feminist, all that stuff. And I said, I'd love to see the, the, the doctor regenerate as a woman because I think that would make for interesting stories. Oh, no, the doctor's inherently male well why what's inherent about what's inherently masculine about the dog justice and it's like oh god because they'd already had a joke moment where the doctor was very briefly a woman on a special a while and, back and and it, it it was a complete shutting down of all principles this person claimed to believe in because she had a crush mm. yeah and let's be honest, they did Jodie Whittaker a huge disservice because the writing in her her seasons, absolute yeah. garbage. Well, they changed so much of the formula in yeah. those shows. And I understand the reasons why they did it, but I, I, I don't agree with them, but I understand them. And as a tangent, I think that's a really important indicator of somebody not being toxic when someone can say i understand the reasons here's what they are here's why i disagree at least you're understanding what the creative team was operating under it uh -huh. isn't i don't care it's not what i like that's I, as somebody who has had to been on the receiving end of absolutely brutal criticism i mean i was called a traitor to my gender for taking a tv show opportunity when i was like what 26 years old you mm -hmm. don't turn down work when you're that age yeah and you know the stuff that was said about me nobody talked to me nobody asked me what i was doing you know so i i am i had a well it wasn't even a front row seat i was the main event in this People who claim to elevate, ele elevate women, attacking women for taking work. And if you can show any empathy or understanding for the other side, 
it goes a long way into not being toxic. I personally think that people should use as use as little velocity as required to make your case. There is nothing gained in going, you know, totally flipping out over anything fictional. But again, that and I don't want to lose this point you made about the overinvestment. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually want to expand yeah. on that point a bit. And again, a lot of my fandom experience was from Tumblr. Right. And the, th <laughs> the, th the thing about Tumblr it is it was very insular. Oh yeah. I, I won't quite say it was an echo chamber. And like even even putting aside the politics, although it was very hard to separate politics and fandom in some cases, but just focusing on the fandom, it's you would create these circles where it's you're following people who talk about your fandom and who create art. And sometimes you're writing fan fiction and you're creating art or you're creating edits. You are putting a lot of energy into this and you're also getting feedback from other people. Mm -hmm. And it creates this, I don't want to imply that fandom as a whole is bad. I don't want to imply right that this creation is bad but especially when you get a lot of introverted teenagers and young adults who haven't built their identity in themselves and who just make their identity they these stories they like okay. or these characters they relate to and then sometimes you do add on these identity politics issues and it's not even about the politics it's oh, I'm this, it's like, okay, I'm gay or I'm trans or I'm non-binary or I'm this, that, or the other, or even I'm black or Latino or mm -hmm. any Latin or any of these things. Mm -hmm. And you make that so much your identity and it becomes so much about these labels. And then you latch onto anything that lines up with that label and it, you become so fiercely protective of it because you're protecting a part of yourself and you can't differentiate you can't find the line mm -hmm. between yourself and this thing because it, it's it's not an outside ip anymore it's part of who you are yeah and and even sometimes we see that with the star wars fans it's nostalgia it's I've been a fan of this thing since I was six years old or two years old or whatever. That that's a whole, that's a different kind of nostalgia clinging to a more innocent time. There's something else that, and I see it more with female fans and female led fandoms where it's very much, this is a part of who I am. And so if you attack that, you're attacking me. Right. And that's part of what leads into this. And and this is part of what creates a lot of the fandom wars where it's if someone views something differently from the way you do, then they're not seeing it from your perspective. So you can't trust them. And how dare they see it any other way than mm. this way that it relates to you. And sometimes it's fandom projection. And sometimes it is also fetish. I, yeah. I got really sick of... And like, here's the thing, I see a lot of people are like, oh, my headcanon is that this character is trans. And right. I'm not even getting into the Gwen Stacy thing right now. That is too new. That is too big. I'm not touching that. Oh, that's a weird one. And and yeah, yeah. The, the, let, let's save that for people to yeah. see the movie. And yeah, yeah. We're, I haven't seen the movie. I'm not going into that. Th that yeah i think that's, so it, that's not touched for yeah, it, yeah it's and it's not just so it's like oh well i i really like this character i relate to it and i'm trans so i'm going to headcanon that this character is trans for me even when i wrote fan fiction for me it's like okay there are borders that are set by by the actual ip you have to work within that you cannot put something on a character 
that's not there, which is why in a lot of cases, it's like you get these these stories where a character is very much implied straight. It, it's like how like, to train like your dragon. Supergirl yeah. for me. Well, Supergirl to- the TV shows. Kara is straight. I don't understand. Yeah. Why people to, took it the way they did. How to Train Your Dragon, Hiccup and Astrid. It's Oh, Hiccup it, is so straight, he curves and becomes straight again. <laughs> and that that's what's so frustrating. It's like the fandom was like, no, we want him to kiss Jack Frost. And I'm like, okay, so draw draw that. Which they so make do. That. Yeah, they, so they, make that. That's fine. Don't demand it. Yeah it come into the work yeah it 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 wasn't so much that it's just it, you see it so consistently with so many of these fandoms where it's no i want them to be gay and i'm like no hiccup and jack would be great friends there would be hiccup constantly going oh my god why why can't you be sensible why do you have to keep doing these things but that's a fun dynamic so yeah. it's like I, I enjoyed writing that in fan fiction. For I, those who don't know, Jack Frost is from Rise of the Guardians. Yeah, Rise <laughs> of the Guardians. He's voiced by Chris Pine. Pine. Yes. Yeah, so you you get a sense of how he was sort of brooding and and yeah. So, but I mean, okay, I'm going to say just mm-hmm. in in the interests of I don't know, fairness is even the right term. Mm-hmm. Um. Um. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the other side to that as it was explained to me, and I hope that I get it right. Mm-hmm. And, and then I want to add possibly my own perspective on something where I think this backfired badly. Yeah. Uh, but it was explained to me, especially with older members of fandom who are, who are gay, mm-hmm. that for so long they had to do this because they there were no out gay characters that you know some people say just let us have our fun but they're advocating leave it leave it open leave it ambivalent Mm -hmm. Don't, don't say one way or the other now that the the thing is that doesn't work either because look at the BBC Sherlock show. That show straight up when I say queer baited, do you know what that term means? Oh, I I do. Yeah, yeah. Like they went so into the hints that it, there was some homoerotic tension there that it ended up being. I mean, Sherlock poisoned Watson's pregnant wife, and people say they he just drugged her. He knew it wouldn't hurt her. He's he's an expert. You knocked out your best friend's wife Uh that's yes he is defined as a as a sociopath Uh but that is not high functioning that is so way over the line yeah and they defend that and then you know you get into and in that case the that is actual queer baiting. There's some pe- times where people okay, accuse so you agree. the creator. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. There's some cases where people accuse the creators of queer baiting, and I'm like, no, that was just you seeing what you wanted to see. Yeah. Sherlock was an actual example where they would alternate between mocking the fans and teasing them. Yeah, and with that, and just being, yeah, absolutely. I, I, awful. I have so many issues with that no. show but the no. other i mean the two in marvel i found one very interesting the other i actually i had one of those i won't say toxic reactions but extremely strong identity driven reactions mm-hmm. to to something now one was falcon and winter soldier mm-hmm. which you know bucky barnes being bisexual coded that one I think is fair for people to speculate on. It, it, and like that one, I don't think that one would bother me so much if it wasn't such a consistent trend that every time guys are friends, people are like, oh, they want to bang. No. And, like, and yes, but the other thing is like, look, Bucky, yeah, maybe. And I mean, they did it. They did a really good job in Doom Patrol showing how messed up gay 
guys were and they joined the military and you know they they were closeted and all that stuff they do they did it with Larry Trainer and it was really well done I don't rule out that Bucky Barnes may be bisexual or maybe he's flat out gay have we ever actually seen him in a long-term relationship with a woman well okay he was part of a brainwashing program maybe maybe he's like nothing but <laughs> Sam Wilson there's nothing that reads gay about mm -mm. anything that character does. And for people to jump on Anthony Mackie because he came, came out, <laughs> that's the terrible term here. He came out as straight, you know, his character <laughs> came out as straight. And I, yeah, like that shouldn't have had to have been said. Mm -hmm. And I do think that they've, that this whole thing is starting to make a mockery of of all these issues and in some cases it actually confuses people as to what it means well there was um there was a show i think it's called, called heart stoppers okay it's like a young adult show on okay. netflix i think but one of the actors is like probably 18, 19 now, but when he was 18 last year, he, he had to come out on social media. Oh, I remember because that. Yes. Fans were speculating so much and you could tell he was not happy about no, it. No. He was like, you guys have, for you've taken this away from me. You forced me yeah. to come out. And that, that's another thing, you know, it's, I remember when I found out Netflix was making a live action death note. Uh, and yeah one of, one of the themes of death note and i don't know if it's an actual theme or just something i picked up on it is obsession oh yeah which okay i'm glad it's not just no me. that yeah. Well, yeah that that kind of it's like a it's like a super powered holmes and moriarty thing except the story's focused on moriarty yeah yeah and so th it, there's this obsession and when when a friend told me oh yeah they're making a live action death note i'm like but they're setting it in america i'm like you can't do that because japan does obsession in a particular way yes i'm like i really hope it doesn't sound racist or anything to say that but it's like no because because their sense of the self is different yeah and yeah. so it, it's this intense fascination and now ironically a couple of years later i started to see it more in the West, especially as we saw the rise of the K-pop stands. Mm -hmm. And even then, it's it's more feral. Like, because sometimes the West just is more animalistic <laughs> than the right. East. Right. And so it's like, it went from this intense kind of seething obsession that you get in Japanese culture to this feral, rabid obsession that we get in the West. Mm hmm and it's like it, there's it, it, they've reached a similar pitch but they're still very different so mm -hmm. i'm like well why are, why are you doing an american live action death note just what a yeah. waste of willem dafoe who was actually yeah, fantastically I, cast as ryu i admit i didn't see it i stayed away because of that whole ghost in the shell yeah shit storm and i didn't see it either i saw a few i watched a few reviews on on see, youtube see my uh, attitude is if if the japanese want to make money off of westerners on their ip and so they want to adapt a japanese property and use western actors go ahead take their money you know yeah. I, i'm good with that i i'm not i just don't like uh cartoon it's very hard for me to like a uh, an anime to live action adaptation just mm -hmm. because the art is such a huge part of it and there's really no point in me even attempting it because of that you know i'm i'm not i i the western version of that to me was sandman i'm mm -hmm. just never going to feel the walking dead was the same way to me when you have this very obvious art style in a comic and that is so much a part of the experience it feels like i'm losing a sense when it's taken away and that's not me saying it's bad and that's not me saying there's 
you know, there's nothing wrong with somebody if you don't have that attachment. It's just nothing is for everyone. And I think that that's central to this whole point of uh, to if you don't like this, you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and and let me give you an example of of something. It's the MCU thing again. I have and it's pride. So I can talk about this as pride month. I have a real issue with labeling uh, with the and yes, the the time variance authority is evil i get that but disney tried to score points with the gender non-conforming community by labeling loki gender queer or gender fluid sorry gender fluid it's on his uh-huh. file uh-huh. and i they're really good at pissing me off through that character because i identify with that character a lot and, mm-hmm. you know, this is when I, this is my exercise in checking myself with the identity bit. Um, the, th- there are numerous instances of that character actually inducing a dysphoric state in me, meaning I literally had an out of body experience. You know, when he calls Black Widow a mewling quim mm-hmm. in the Avengers, I literally, my ears started ringing and I was kicked out. I, I didn't remember the the big Hulk action sequence after that. And when I don't remember something involving the Hulk that says something. Somebody said, but yeah, but this is, but they had to do that to get to that. I'm like, what do you, I went back and watched it. I was like, oh, holy crap. I blanked on all of that because that was my insides reducing my outsides to a body part. Mm-hmm. And you'll notice the conflict there. I mean, I am the tomboy of this team. This should surprise no one. <laughs> but I do not, I have a really bad reaction to one being reduced to my body, but also having a label forced on me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, this is the same show where they thought it was funny to torture the guy by replaying a memory where Sif kicked him in the balls over and over and over again. I had a, again, they're evil, but you would think somebody there would be going, this is torture. Why are you doing this? Here's the thing that for me feels like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, because that, that feels like a black pill feminist fantasy of like, oh, terrible men. I just want to, you know. It, it's also do it's also trying to redeem him through torture, and and that doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. But you know, here's the issue with what they did regarding gender identity. Loki's a shapeshifter, mm-hmm. changes his body. That has nothing to do with how he sees himself, how he relates to his body. Mm -hmm. Um, he's a very interesting character because his external appearance was actually given to him by Odin. His default state is not how he actually looks. And they, they dealt with some of that in, in uh, dark world, not well, but they at least made the attempt. And, and so for, for Disney, for the, the creators to for, cause they, there were all, there was all this, stuff about oh he's the first gender fluid character in the mcu nobody asked him Mm -hmm. and a person's gender identity is up to them it is not how you look on the outside it is how it is it is what you see as you as you're going about the world we know we have parts of our brain that obsess about where we fit in the world and and identity like you said that identity piece they can't on the one hand try to convince people that identity is real and you're supposed to believe people when they say what they are and then force labels on a character to try to score points you do not decide for someone what they are and i hate all the you know i don't like the term non-binary i don't like um uh, there is not there is not a word that describes me 
Because I Mm -hmm. used to think, okay, gender apathetics, right. But then I realized with some of this stuff, you know, I I spent last week being told, uh, you know, a woman is someone with an adult with ovaries. And I was actually nauseous. It actually made me physically ill. And that is not something my brain does. Even I find that reductionist. It's, it's, it's really, really offensive is the wrong word. It's sickening mm-hmm. and a literal thing. And I know not everybody has that reaction. I do. And me, I just want to be me. I don't want to be forced to have this be important as much as I talk about, you know, my inner voices are Kratos and Billy Butcher from God of War and Billy Butcher from the boys. And, you know, I relate to Loki and all. Yes, these are male characters. Yes, yes, that's true. I don't want to put a, I don't have a label that feels right. Please stop. And these, these fandoms and, and these people who claim to be on the side of good just ignore all the feedback like that they're getting because ideas. I don't, do you think it's ideas being more than more important than people or that it's a solipsism that the only thing they can comprehend is their frame. They cannot get that other people experience things differently. I'm leaning towards it being the idea being more important because I just remembered, you know, when the live action Cowboy Bebop came out, you know, the big controversy was, no, we want Faye to be sexy. Oh no, well, how dare you toxic masculine. The the controversy that kind of got swept under the rug unless you were talking to people who actually knew the source material. Right. Was so there's the one character who is a man he is male, right. but he wants revenge. So he subjected himself to military testing right. that, forced, that caused him to grow breasts. But at the same time, there is nothing about the character in the original story, from what I understand, that he identifies as that. It is a consequence of something that was done that, to him. That's a Japanese gender. J- Japan has gender constructs we do not have in the West. Yeah. And but this- but. Yeah, it's a it's a big debate whether you are you are whitewashing a, a a work of Japanese fiction if you try to force it into our gender boxes, and I I think that's but, that's a valid complaint. But I mean, they cast a non-binary actor to play the character who then went went on the was like, I'm so proud to be playing this non-binary icon, and it's like. Oof. You you don't know the character. That that's that's a tough one. That that's not what the character's story and they made him a, a nightclub owner. Oh, that's like, right. Is yeah. that uh, yeah. I mean, there was a lot wrong with yeah. that with that so, cowboy bebop adaptation. It's it's kind of hard to pull it apart. The whole thing, yeah. the whole thing was just a miss. That was one I wasn't expecting to like it. I didn't like it. I think no. it even looked cheap. Like yeah. shooting it in 60 frames per second was a weird choice. Like everything human, about it was just weird. Yeah. I mean, the human brain only comprehends 40 to 60 frames per second in order to see a fluid image. Just Yeah. And, whatever. and but I mean, it just looked like when you use high def, when you use, when you use different frame rates, it, Lee, it it creates this something's different and I can't put my figure on finger on what response in the audience and and you gotta be real careful mm-hmm. um how you use that and is a retro property like is a nostalgia property really the right place to do that I mean Cowboy Bebop is so 80s yeah. And I I just think that attitude, because that to me, it, it feels very similar to what you were talking about with Loki, where it's, oh, this character doesn't, we're going to stick a label on them just because yeah. it's trendy. I mean, I, I don't have an issue with casting a non-binary actor for that part to sort of, because they can understand the physical reality of 
how do I, I got to frame this very carefully because yeah. a non-binary person is not a trans person, but you can understand dysphoria. And there's a guy, he is a guy who huh. is going to feel out of place in his own body because he's looking at a body part that shouldn't be there. So casting and, the non-binary actor isn't the problem yeah, for me. It's, it's the defining, attitude. Yes. Uh -huh. It's defining the character that way. And people in the West really need to stop. I won't go so far as to call it racist, but back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth, when I was in gender <laughs> studies, we used to call it um, Eurocentrism. Mm -hmm. Because we studied this phenomenon of gender identities around the world, in Polynesia, in, in the African subcontinent, in Asian countries that don't exist in the white, you know, Christian influenced framing. Mm -hmm. When you don't have monotheism, you don't have the same rigid ideals of masculine and feminine and i mean there's there's family rules in polynesia that basically give a role to uh, a gay or gender non-conforming aunt and uncle they actually mm -hmm. have a role there's actually things they can do in society that other people can't and you know we were taught that to force a western lens on that was a problem because mm -hmm. we don't have the appropriate frame to understand. I mean, the big one in Japanese stuff is the Okama, Okama um, designation. It's it's basically a catch-all phrase for everyone from gay people in Japan to gender non-conforming people. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, it's almost like they're LGBTQ. Yeah. And when people there's a character in the yakuza games who goes by mama mm -hmm. and, sorry not mama she she's a bartender and she does she is referred to as a she and she's essentially a trans woman but she's not called that and i really struggle with how to explain that character to people because it's this really cool storyline about how she develops a crush on the main character, Kiryu, who's <laughs> so straight. There's actually a line in Yakuza 2 is, that is something like, to be a real man, you have to be a bit stupid. Like, they, <laughs> just, they stick a pin in toxic masculinity, and it's so beautiful, and I am cheering with this butt-stupid ending because I'm like, all right, they know it's dumb. I know it's dumb. I can enjoy it because everybody involved in this knows exactly what this is and i do think that that particular character would not would not object to being referred to as trans because she lives every day all the time as a woman mm -hmm. but to another character could be called the same thing i know that what is it guilty gear had a character and somebody changed the origin. It was another one of those ones where gender was iffy and they made it a Western construct that it wasn't intended to be. And it became this huge stink and mm -hmm. people fought. And I just think that if you're not letting the culture in question set the terminology that's the same thing as not letting the individual set the terminology we always have to default to how close can we get to letting the individual maintain agency and it's more like it's more reasonable to assume that somebody from a culture would use the terms from their culture not not westerners terms <laughs>